Warm welcome to you. Good to see you all. You have noticed my change of shirt this evening. I'm not trying to be stylish or anything and uh, keep up with the latest trends. It's just uh, a young lad <coughs> smeared me with biscuit this morning. I think most of you know him well. But uh, warm welcome to you all. Let's, uh, let's come before the Lord. Let's pray before we do anything else. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity to meet in your house tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. And Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the blessings of this morning. We thank you for joy. And we thank you for conviction. And Father, we pray that you would draw close to us again tonight. We pray, Father, especially for those who are unwell at the moment, those who are sick, those who are struggling physically and mentally. Lord, we bring the Wilson family before you especially and pray for little baby Beatrice. We pray for healing in her heart. We pray that she would be able to breathe without that ventilator in the days ahead. And we pray, Lord, for uh, Naomi uh, to make use of her time wisely. Uh, so many battles in her mind, uh, so many struggles and frustrations. Uh, but Lord, she's leaning on you. And we know you won't let her down. You can't. It's not within your character or nature. So, Father, we thank you for being close uh, to the family. We thank you for sustaining them and giving Paul traveling mercies as he uh, you know, wrestles and uh, tries to juggle working, uh, working from home here and, and looking after the other children and then seeing his uh, newborn daughter as well. So, Lord, be close to that family, we ask. And, Father, we do remember Dave uh, Porter, uh, we think of him in the next few weeks with some uh, very important uh, meetings, medical meetings. Uh, we pray you would prepare him in his mind for whatever your will is. And uh, we just thank you for him, Lord. Thank you for um, how he's drawn so close to you in, in these days of pain and suffering. And we pray for Wendy too, Lord, that she would be uh, such a helper to Dave and, and such an encouragement and strength, uh, continually pointing him to Jesus. And Lord, we, we also think of, of those who uh, are struggling, uh, not just with, with physical things, but with mental challenges. Uh, we pray for all those who are struggling uh, with mental health struggles and uh, darkness that comes upon them. Uh, we pray for those who are lonely, those who are mourning, and those who are suffering in all kinds of different ways. And Father, we think about our brothers and sisters across the world as well, especially those being persecuted uh, we thank you for their faith. We thank you that they are holding tight to you. And we thank you that you're not letting them down either. And uh, we just pray for something of that here in this country. And if we need to be persecuted uh, for us to be more fervent in our faith, for us to be more committed and stand firmer, then your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But Lord, we, we do ask for revival in this county we ask that you would uh, start with us, that you would begin that work uh, of igniting a fire in our own hearts that would spread throughout this county and nation, uh, that we would get to witness many, many people being saved and restored, loads and loads of people entering the kingdom of heaven. And we pray, Lord, um, all these things for your glory's sake. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our first hymn together this evening, Tell Me the Old, Old Story.
take a seat. A couple of quick announcements. So this week we've got home groups, uh, mostly Wednesday evening, uh, but the Bodenham group often meet on a Thursday, isn't it, Joan? Daytime on a Thursday. Uh, so Simon will be in touch about that. Um, if you're not part of a home group and you would like to be, please come and speak to me either tonight or at any point and we'll try and get, well, we will get you in one, but we'll try and get you in one as near to where you live as, as possible to keep your, your travelling time down, if we can. Uh, Wednesday morning, time for tots. And Tuesday morning, we're meeting as elders, so please pray for us as we pray for you. And uh, <laughs> seek God's guidance uh, going forward as a fellowship. And the other announcement was the ladies. So anyone who's booked on for Lee Abbey, payment needs to be made by the 1st of April. Uh, so if you can see Carla, if you're unsure how much you owe, Carla's got it all down on an Excel spreadsheet because she's organised and um, she'll help you out with that. Okay, let's turn to God's Word. So if you're using the, the Chapel Bibles, it's page 943, it's Romans chapter 7. And I'm going to read the whole chapter. Actually, I'll read a chunk now and then I'll read a chunk in a bit. So Romans chapter 7, verse 1. So this is the word of God. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What shall we then say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. We'll leave it there for now, and then we'll pick that up in a little while from verse 13. But we're going to sing again now, and then we'll have a look at Romans chapter 7 together. The next hymn, Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly while the nearer waters roll. Let's stand if you're able and sing together.
So if we um, try and cast our minds back quite a few weeks ago now to Romans <laughs> chapter 6, uh, we talked about Jesus Christ setting us free from the penalty of sin and setting us free from the power of sin. Sin's now unnatural to a Christian. And it's unwelcomed to us as well. We don't want it. We also spoke about grace and how we're now under grace, but does that mean we can just carry on sinning? By no means. We don't take God's grace for granted. We don't abuse it. We actually use it to fight off sinful desires and temptations. We need God's grace every single day. And what's grace? Help from heaven that we don't deserve. God's favour. And we use that grace to grow as Christians. And, and the word that we, we talk about quite a lot, uh, especially in a lot of Christian books, is sanctification. That's our growth into the likeness of Jesus to become more holy. So it's God who justifies. He makes us right with himself. And it's God who sanctifies. And I'll give you a couple of scriptures for that in a moment. One Christian writer says, In sanctification, the Holy Spirit infuses grace and enables the subduing of sin. So if we think to ourselves, okay, well, I need the Holy Spirit to help me change, to, to make me more like Jesus. But then when we're tempted by sin, we sometimes foolishly think we can handle that on our own, and we can't. That's when we need the Holy Spirit's help as well. That's when we need God's grace to be able to deny the evil one, deny those sinful desires that still remain in us. And that's really a lot of what Romans 7 is going to say to us, I think, this evening. It's about our battle going on inside. So our old, original nature is dead when we come to faith in Jesus. So the old me, if you like, died with Jesus at the cross. And the new me rose with Jesus at the resurrection. So there was, there was something of me there, like there was something of me in Adam when Adam sinned. Here's the difficulty. Our record in heaven states that we're clean, pure, perfect, holy. But that's not often how we feel, is it? But whoever has a new record in heaven has a new life on earth. 1 John 3 says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. And that leads us into chapter 7 because Paul mentions the law more in this chapter than anywhere else. It's riddled with the law. And our sanctification as well. So I'll give you a couple of scriptures as examples. So Jeremiah 23, the Lord is our righteousness or our justification, depending on what translation you've got. So he's responsible for our justification. We can't get ourselves right with God by any other means than God making us right with him. That's the only way it's possible. I can't earn my way to heaven it doesn't matter what I do, I need him. I'm completely reliant on his grace to save me, to justify me, make me righteous. And in Exodus 31, the Lord said to Moses, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. I, the Lord, sanctify you. So Romans has already taught us that we can't be justified by the law. The law in and of itself doesn't, doesn't help us in that sense. And now in chapter 7, he's teaching us that the law is not to be despised, but it can't sanctify us either. So if we think to myself, right, I want to grow in holiness, I want to be more like Jesus, so I'm going to keep the law. And that's my motivation, that's my obligation and that's going to make me more like Jesus, because Jesus kept the law. It doesn't quite work like that. So the law reveals God's way. The law exposes sin in the world. But even if we obey it outwardly, 
that that conformity is not sanctification. Inwardly, we might not be changing at all, even though our outward behaviour is really good. And we know that, don't we? We can clean ourselves up quite well on the outside. We can put on our Sunday best. We can come to church. And when people ask us, are we doing okay? Guess what? I'm fine. I'm actually doing quite well. <laughs> Outwardly, we look the part. But inwardly, we can have all kinds of mess going on inside. So the law can't really help us with that. Romans 3, verse 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. And then Galatians 3.10 says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. The first thing Paul does in Romans 7 is he gives this example of marriage. And he says, look, you're only under law, you're only bound by the law while you're living under it. So your legal, legal obligation ends with death. And then he's going to go on to say, you died with Jesus at the cross. Because you're in Christ. So you're not bound by the legal obligation of the law anymore. You're free. There would have been a lot of Jews reading this, panicking at this point. Thinking, what is he doing? What about the Psalms? Your law is honey. Your law is treasure. It's glorious. What about the words of Jesus? I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So what's going on? Well, Jesus did fulfill all the demands of the law. And Jesus is now living in you, if you're a Christian, by his spirit. He's guiding you and empowering you and enabling you to keep the law. But you can't keep it. And you don't keep it not for salvation and not for sanctification, but there's one major difference. You want to keep it. You want to live by God's law now. You never used to. Couldn't care less. In actual fact, when you found out about the law, it might have prompted you to do the opposite, to break it. That's a good idea. I'll break that. So your relationship as a Christian under the law is done it was finished at the death of Jesus on the cross but you entered into another relationship with the giver of the law so now things are starting to change because Jesus has kept it and he continues to keep the law because that's God's way that's how God lives that's a beautiful way to God and that's how he wants us to live now because that's how we're going to live forever. We're going, there's going to be a day when we keep the law forever. We'll never lie. We'll never covet. We'll never commit idolatry. Never do any of those things. It's going to be a glorious day. So we're not, when we become Christians, we're not free of all commitment. It's just the commitment changes. It, it's different in a sense that we're we're now committed directly to Jesus, so it's more personal. We're not committed to a bunch of laws. We're committed to the one who gave them, the one who kept them. And we're in Christ. We're so in union with him that, that what he loves, we now love. Well, I hope we do. So it's not just rules anymore. And because of that, because it's a relational thing now, it's love that motivates us to keep the law not obligation, and that changes everything. Because that goes from religion to relationship. So the motivation, the heart, is very different. On the outside, they can look exactly the same. You can just look like two people who really want to keep to some rules. <coughs> but one is keeping to the, those rules because they think, if I keep these rules outwardly, well, that'll get me to heaven. The other person knows they're going to heaven. And so they want to keep those rules. The desire in their heart is they want to live that way because that's the way God lives. That's his way. And that's now my way. 
So outwardly they look the same, but inwardly the motivation is very, very different. Verse 5 says, For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. So while we were connected to the first Adam, and we were not in Christ, we, we didn't believe in Jesus, we were directed and we were controlled, really, by sin. And then the, the, the law revealed to us a bunch of rules that we didn't love because we didn't love the one who, who gave them either. So the law really only just tried to restrict us in our behavior. And we thought, no, I'm not having that. I'm not keeping to those rules. I'm not obligated to them. And even if we tried to keep them, we didn't. And we just headed deeper down a pathway of sin on a, roll, a road to death. And then verse 6, it says, But now we're released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So the written code is rules. Do not do this, do not do that. The way of the Spirit is God living in us, guiding us, saying... You don't want to do that, do you? You don't want to do that. And we don't. Because we know what it leads to. It leads to death. It leads to sin. Mess. Chaos. Pain. Suffering. So we don't want to break the law. Being delivered from that road. We were released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit. So we're now in love with the rule giver. So we're not just trying to keep rules. We're joined to Jesus. We're living to please him. We're living to obey him. And he wants us to live in this way. So law keeping now becomes love revealing. It reveals where our heart is. How much are we in love with Jesus? It's not that God's just given us an ability to, to keep to rules. It's he shared himself with us. And so his union with us enables us to live in that way. Not perfectly, but we're changing. We're becoming slowly, but we're becoming more like him because of that union that we have with the living God. So it's a bit like in a relationship, a human relationship. So Carla and I got together. Carla was 14, I was 15. We met in school. She, I remember going around to her parents' house and she always had lots of fruit. And I hated fruit. I know it was crazy playing football professionally. You'd think I ate really, really healthy, lots and lots of fruit, hated it. But she kept on coaxing me over the years to try different fruits. I try a bit of melon, try a bit of melon. And gradually, I started to trust her because she would tell me, this is really good for you. And this tastes really nice. And you'll like this, and you'll like it with a bit of yogurt. And, and as our relationship grew over time, the more I began to trust her, the more we were in union together, and I started to like the things she liked. Now I really like fruit. <laughs> and it's Carla's fault. And that's the way with Jesus, isn't it? The more time we spend with him, reading his word and in prayer, we start to dislike the things that he dislikes, but also to love the things that he loves. He's changing us on the inside. Our desires are changing. It's not the old desires are gone completely, as we'll see in a minute. There's still a battle going on, but that union with him is, is molding us. Then we get to verses 7 to 13. So the law revealed to Paul that he was a failure in comparison with God's standards. Because the law highlighted his sin, it exposed his sin. And there's nothing wrong with the law, but there was something very wrong with him. And that's what he realized. He said, I didn't even know what coveting was, let alone it being wrong. But does that make the law sinful? No, of course not. It doesn't at all. It's a bit like, um, I remember somebody years ago talking about an MRI machine. And um, they, they were saying anything 
can be used in a bad way. So I think the point they were trying to make is an MRI machine reveals sickness and disease. So does that mean that the MRI machine is diseased? Of course not. That would be a silly thing to say. But even something as good as an MRI machine that can help in such an amazing way, can expose things hidden beneath the surface, that even that can be used in a bad way. You, know, you could say to somebody, oh, you, you've only got six months to live. The MRI has showed us that. Therefore, go and just blow all the money that you have. Don't worry about who you hurt. You're going to die anyway in six months. Just go and live a reckless life. It's going to be over soon anyway. So even something good that's revealing something good can be used in a negative way. But that's what the devil does. That's what sin does with the law. Something that's beautiful, something that's good... The devil will use that to, to twist the good thing, to lead you down a very dangerous path. So Paul says, the problem is, with the law, is it stirred me up to do the very things that it prohibits. So it's a bit like our tactic with toddlers and teenagers, isn't it? If you want them to do something, you tell them to do the opposite, and then they'll do the thing that you wanted them to do. Paul says, well, that, that seems to be happening with me. And that does work. And, and this is the point I think he's making. You know, if you said to somebody, a teenager, I don't want you going down to that park because it's quite dangerous down there, their reaction might be, oh, I've got such a loving parent that doesn't want me to get hurt. More likely, as a teenager, they're thinking, I never even thought of going down that park. I'll give it a try tomorrow. We, we put the idea in their head by telling them not to do it. Now they suddenly want to do it. It brings out that rebellious nature. Wet paint, do not touch. I want to touch it. Do not enter. I'm going in. <laughs> That's how some of us are. That's how I am, unfortunately. My favourite one when I was a kid was my mum would say, don't go in the, in the spare room cupboard because that's where I've hidden your Christmas presents. I was like, I hadn't even thought of going in there. <laughs> Guess where I'm going tomorrow? Stuart Elliott said, God gave the Ten Commandments so, that, so we might know his will, do it, and live. He gave us the Ten Commandments so we might know his will, do it, and live. Okay, let's uh, carry on reading from verse 13. But just to say, verse 7 to 13 is written in the past tense. But now we're going to have a shift, and it's now going to be written in the present tense, because this is the present experience of a Christian. Okay? So verse 13. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh." For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. You can feel the Apostle Paul's frustration, can't you? 
And I'm sure we all share this same frustration that even having a godly desire to do something good is enough for the devil to jump all over us. Even those who desire to do good will welcome trouble. And that shouldn't scare us. It shouldn't put us off wanting to do good because actually if we're joined to Jesus, that's going to happen. That's a natural byproduct of being a Christian. You will want to do good things. You will want the things that God wants. You will hate the things that he hates. But the difficulty and the battle that we have internally is the devil wants to use the flesh, the old you that died at the cross, that's dead, and he wants to dig you up from the grave and say, no, no, there's still something there. Don't you miss those old ways? I'm sure you miss them. And we have the hope that one day this battle is going to be over when our actions will always match our desires. But currently, we're a bit of a contradiction, aren't we? Inwardly, we're one thing. Outwardly, we're another thing. In heaven's sight, we're one thing. In the world's sight, we're another thing. And we literally feel like we're being pulled apart sometimes. And that's the the root for a lot of words that the Bible uses about confusion and anxiety and, and all those other things. And these acts of sin, Paul says, these are against my my new nature, the real me. This is not the real me. That's the old me. But I've still got the makeup of Adam lurking in me. My surviving sin, it, it frustrates me. I, I was chatting to somebody this morning and we were talking about this, how when, when you first come to faith, sometimes God just, just gets rid of things. So, so for me, it was, it was language. So my, my really bad language just disappeared overnight. I didn't have to work at it. I didn't pray about it. I can take no credit for it at all. I I didn't do anything. I just stopped using really bad words. Just did. And I kind of thought, oh, this is easy being a Christian. God's just sorted out all this horrible stuff. And now I'm like this new person. I'm pretty much like angelic. This is really cool. But then I realized very quickly that he didn't get rid of everything. There was a lot of sin still lurking. And a lot that still lurks today that I have to battle with every single day and pray about and fight against. That's not the real me. That's not the new me. That's the old me, rearing its ugly head. And what do we do with it? Kill it. Be brutal with it. Don't play around with it. We kill that sin. Because that's not me anymore. It's got to go. And that's the resurrection life of the Christian. Because my body, well, my body's bound for death. I'm not worried about my body. But I'm going to be completely free when Jesus returns or calls me home, as we sang this morning. So we're starting to get a a picture that's being built now of of what it looks like to to be a Christian and and what you have to go through. So if you've been listening to these sermons on Romans, you're probably thinking, if you're not a Christian, you're probably thinking, I don't even know if I want to be one. Sounds like right hard work. I'll be bothered with all that. It's a battle. But the Christian is not ruled by sin. So we're not free from sin, as verse 6 and 7 says, but we're not ruled by it. So sin doesn't reign, but sin, unfortunately, does sometimes ruin in our lives. But here's the difference between the Christian and the unbeliever. The unbeliever is at peace with sin and at war with God. The believer is at war with sin, but at peace with God. And that's a really big difference. The unbeliever lives in sin. The believer, despite sin living in us, doesn't live in sin. 1 Corinthians 15 puts it like this. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have been born the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. In other words, unless we have a union with 
the man from heaven, Jesus Christ, the one and only one who has lived perfectly, keeping the law on our behalf, the one who has trusted in him, the one who's in union with him, the one who has had this sin paid for at the cross by him. Well, you're with the man of heaven, so you will go to heaven. If not, you're of the man of the dust, so you will return to the dust. J.C. Ryle, in his book on holiness that I recommended a few weeks back, wrote this. I fear it is sometimes forgotten that God has married together justification and sanctification. They are distinct and different things beyond question. But one is never found without the other. All justified people are sanctified. And all sanctified are justified. What God has joined together, let no man dare to put asunder. Tell me not of your justification unless you have also some marks of sanctification. Boast not of Christ's work for you unless you can show the Spirit's work in you. So if you've been saved, if you've been made right with God, you will change. You will be made more like Jesus. And it's not going to happen overnight, unfortunately. And it's not going to happen in a perfectly graduated line like that. It's going to be like that. But hopefully, prayerfully, we're committed to this. Committed to holiness like J.C. Ryle was. We should see progress. We should become more sensitive to sin. We should become more sensitive to this battle. And we should abandon the old self and go to war with sin every single day because we're no longer bound by Satan and sin and death or the law. We're free, free to enjoy eternal life. Because we can, we can look good under the law, but as Romans 7 says, it won't bear any fruit. And well, I don't know about you, I want to bear fruit. It's one of the signs that we belong to Jesus, that we have love for one another, that we are fruitful that we portray love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. The one I always forget, and self-control. This went out. The Lord knows. High King of heaven, thou heaven's bright sun, oh, grant me its joys after victory is won. Great heart of my own heart, whatever before, Still be thou my vision, O ruler of all. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn together. And then once we've finished singing, we're just going to have a, a little open time of prayer. So maybe three or four people. Um, if you feel comfortable praying out loud, that's great. If you don't, that's absolutely fine. Uh, please feel free to pray in the quietness of, of your own mind and heart. Um, but yeah, as soon as we finish singing... Feel free to pray if you're led to do that. And I'll close our time with prayer at the end. Thanks, St. Harrod. Mm -hmm.